So welcome to the Shoreline Conversations podcast. This week uh, we have Kevin back, and uh, we're going to be talking about uh, you know reaching the lost and and uh, outreach. And Kevin obviously has a lot to to say about this, uh, but really we're focusing on the reality of the need for authenticity uh, as we reach people with the gospel. So uh, let's jump into this with Kevin Hardy. Well, Kevin, it's uh, it's good to have you back. I know you've been you've been kind of out and doing uh, some vacations, some like offsite working and uh, working with Sherry, and so uh, it's good to have you back. We had a great time with uh, Pastor Keith and Pastor Clint Dupin yep. um, the past two weeks, but it's it's good to have you back. I'm excited for our conversation. Um, but if you want to just uh, share what 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 was your uh, what was your time away like? Was it yeah. fun? Was it relaxing? Was it? Was- it- it, that's it was it was a lot of things. So yeah, so had some time with our grandkids, which is great. Oh, good, good. Um, and then had some time watching my nephew get married. Yeah, and he's thirty six, and so it was a, a exciting celebration with him. And then Sherry and I got about a week to do some writing, and yeah. we're working on a, a fourth book in the organic outreach series called cool. Organic Disciples. And excited uh, for that, just helping people see how when you truly follow Jesus closely as a disciple, if you're really following Jesus, which is what disciple means. Yeah. You follow where Jesus goes, and he goes into the world. He goes yeah. where the broken and the hurting are, where those that are far from the heart of God, but who mm-hmm. God loves. And so we're having a great time working on that together. Good. Sherry and I uh, and actually like writing together. We never sit at the same spot and write. I was going to ask you that. We write yeah. in separate rooms. <laughs> That's and then we send stuff back and forth. Okay. Yeah. So is it not like the, cause I've done like some like group collaboration stuff with like Google docs and stuff. Is it like that? Are you like watching each other or is Ew, it? No. <laughs> we, we, we've been doing this for over 30 years. Yeah. And so what we do is we each have strengths. And so, you know, Sherry will work on it, send it to me. I'll work on it, send it to her. Yeah. Early on, we tried to sit at the same desk and write together and we just fought. I, I can, she's, a, I, she's a difficult woman <laughs> because what it is, we're both so, so strong in our personalities and yeah. so different in how we see things. So we fi- we found out the best way is just to pass the content back and forth, back yeah. and forth, back and forth. And somehow with the gifts she has, the gifts I have, it ends up, uh, it works well enough to where publishers keep wanting us to write yeah. stuff. So, uh, <laughs> and you two want to keep doing it. You and keep we, saying yes. We so. enjoy it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's cool. I know we're, uh, we'll get into some of the organic outreach books and stuff in a bit, but yeah, that's, it's a cool thing to, you know, you know, I've, I've actually learned, um, pretty recently it's, it's fun to, to do things together. Like as a couple, that's like, um, uh, that requires like skill and, and challenge and it's, it's fun. And you start to learn a lot about each other. I think, yeah. you know, I, I've been learning that with Mackenzie, um, with some of the wood stuff that I've been doing and she's mm-hmm. a very talented artist and, uh, yeah, it's been fun seeing how like, you know, design and things that worked it. I'm learning a lot about my wife. It's, it's yeah. interesting. I like that collaborative, uh, uh, you don't have stuff. it completely figured out yet? No. <laughs> I don't I've been told not to plan on that yeah, either. Yeah. But uh yeah, no, she's she's great, but she's very smart and uh, uh I like to pretend I am. So it's sometimes it's uh you know, it's that challenge. It's fun working together though. Yeah. Um so uh you you have uh, in your experience of pastoring, you've you've really um kind of developed that, that idea of organic outreach is, yeah. uh, uh, I think you've said even f- before that it's not really the concept that you've really like developed on your own. It's, it's this practical way to put it into place, mm-hmm. you know, in your mm-hmm. life and mm-hmm. in ministry yeah. and things like that. So, um, you know, I know for a lot of shoreliners, they, they probably have heard this, this, um, you know, idea of organic outreach, but for those that are not really yeah. aware of it, do you mind, uh, yeah. just kind of expressing that a little bit? Yeah, so organic outreach is, uh, I tell people, it's not something that Sherry and I came up with and created mm-hmm. because it uh, we got it all from the Bible. Yeah. Uh, it's it's out of the heart of God. Yeah. And it really is built around the idea that God, everyone who, who's a follower of Jesus knows that there was a point at which they were far from God, their heart was resistant, mm-hmm. and yet God loved them, God sought them, God reached out to them by his Holy Spirit, and by the grace of Jesus, they came to put faith in him. Mm-hmm. So... Um, you know, the three of us sitting here, you know, Thomas and you, Cole, and myself, we all we can all look and go, even if you grew up in the church, uh, which I know the two of you did, I didn't, yeah. but if you grew up in the church, you still, there's a point where you have to say, this is for me, I embrace it, I believe it. Yeah. It's not enough that your parents took you to church, you have to have a point where you put your faith in Jesus. Right. Well, organic outreach is just naturally helping people to know who Jesus is and helping Christians know how to share their faith. Every Christian I know would tell you there's people in my life that don't know Jesus. I wish they knew Jesus. I wish uh, that they knew how much he loved them. I wish that they, uh, I I, I wish that this person would come to understand the grace of Jesus. And if you ask every Christian too, would you like to even be able to help 
people forward that they say, of course I would. That's, yeah. you know, but so how do you do that? Well, that's what makes people nervous. Mm -hmm. Organic outreach is helping people to find natural ways, things that are natural for them and natural for the people, friends and family that aren't Christians, natural for them to hear about Jesus and then hopefully come to a place where they put their faith in Jesus and right. begin to walk with him. So it's just naturally, yeah. naturally sharing your faith. So why is it, you know, I'm thinking a lot about, and we've talked, I've been involved in the the ministry side of organic yeah. outreach here at Shoreline for, for quite some time. And it's, I'm always, um, you know, looking into myself, you know, mm -hmm. and what, why is it hard? Why is it difficult to have these conversations when, with the way you explain it, it sounds so simple. And, mm -hmm. and even the idea of like actually doing, you know, doing it, it's not, it doesn't feel like that big of a challenge, but, but time and time again, we yeah. talk about it and we experience it and it is actually like mm -hmm. a little more difficult, maybe not yeah. for someone who's got that like yeah. evangelistic, uh, you know, spiritual gift, yeah. but, uh, for a lot of people, what, what do you think that is? Is it, yeah. uh, why is it so difficult to have these conversations? Is it, is it, you know, uncomfortability with knowing that how to express the gospel? Is it like a shame or an embarrassment mm -hmm. about like what you believe? Is it, um, apathy i mean is it there there's a lot of different those are all good guesses yeah. Cole. <laughs> uh, let me let me tell you what i've learned through the years yeah i've learned that there's that there's two primary things that make it difficult yeah and then within those two things there's subsets but the first primary thing that makes it difficult is just the simple reality that it's a spiritual battle every time a christian gets ready to talk about their faith mm -hmm. to share how good jesus is if somebody's asking questions about their faith and they want to say well here's what jesus has done for me or here's who he is to me or here's how jesus died on the cross and rose again whatever it is at that moment all the forces of hell yeah rise up and say shut your mouth don't do it you're yeah. going to look like a fool you're going to be yeah. embarrassed you're going to you don't know enough you're going to say yeah. it wrong all the forces of hell just raise up yeah. and do, you know, the, the enemy, I, I always say, I don't think the enemy care, cares if churches have potlucks. I don't think the enemy really cares if we get together and sing, you know, church tunes or whatever. I, I, I don't think, think Satan likes that, but Satan's not going to go to war over those things. But when somebody is sharing the good news of the gospel, the message of Jesus, when somebody is saying, here's what God did to show us love, and here's what could transform your heart, forgive you of sins, change you forever, and mm -hmm. set you on a new destiny— Man, that's that's a battle. Yeah. Because people are leaving the kingdom of darkness and the power of Satan and coming into the heart and the life and the relationship with Jesus Christ that God longs for them to have. Mm -hmm. And so number one, the biggest thing is at that moment when we so so when you're in church and you're hearing a sermon about outreach, you go, That doesn't sound that hard. And I think I could do that. And yeah. I'll give that a shot. Next time I have a chance, I'm gonna share. And then that moment comes and it's like, ah, and there's this this, you know anxiety and worry yeah. there's i think there's a real spiritual battle going on and so this is why we talk a lot about prayer this is why we encourage people to be prepared and equipped so that they feel a peacefulness about it so yeah. so number one spiritual warfare number two the big obstacle i think is personal fear mm -hmm. i think most christians just are are uh, have a level of fear that says i'll do it wrong um i'll say something that isn't quite biblically accurate um I'm not fully equipped for this. And so, so then the fears, and then when you put that first thing, the spiritual warfare, the enemy will build on our fears. Mm -hmm. So spiritual battle and personal fears, and those two things take something that should be fairly easy for somebody to explain, hey, there's a God who loves you. He cares about you. He cares about me. Yeah. Um, he actually sees our wrongs and our sin that we're separate and he still loves us and he made a way for us to come home and to talk about who jesus is mm -hmm. and what he did on the cross most christians go i could do that and then to look at somebody and say would you want to know this jesus and you go that that doesn't sound that complicated but with the spiritual warfare and with the personal fear it is complicated but i believe any christian can get past those fears mm -hmm. and certainly past the spiritual warfare because yeah. we need to walk in the power of jesus and in, in the confidence that we have in him and when we do that god uses us in amazing ways to share his good news with others yeah is that is that kind of why uh this like organic aspect of it is really a key for a lot of people and it gives you know for me that i see those organic um situations come up mostly in my life with like really close relationships that I have with, mm -hmm. with people who are, are, are far from God. So is that really the, the major, uh, um, aspect of why it's gotta be this organic, uh, feel to it? Or is it, is there something else? I mean, yeah. I know, you know, today's climate, uh, there's, there's so much to be fearful of with your words yeah. and being yeah. careful of that. And, and so I think that has put a lot of, I would say unnecessary yeah. fear in people's yeah. hearts and their minds. Um, but is that the aspect of it, the relational yeah, I think that, you know, 
you have organic and inorganic. Yeah. And and so somebody who's not being natural in how they share their faith, it might be that they took a class and they learned how to, they, they learned to say these five things. Yeah. So they're waiting, they're talking to somebody, they're waiting for them mm-hmm. to stop talking. They go, okay, let me tell you these five things yeah. about Jesus. Bop, 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 bop. It's out of and, context. And, yeah, it's yeah. not to you, it's it's yeah. my script. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, organic, so here's an, ex- here's an example of, I had a chance last week to meet a guy uh, who really nice guy, probably in his middle sixties, um, never been married, never had kids, fascinating life. He's, uh, he's, uh, sailed around the world on a number of occasions. He's a longboard surfer and is good friends with Laird Hamilton, who's one of the top wow. big wave surfers in the world. Yeah. And he was, he just pulled up his phone. He says, yeah, you know, this is with me and Laird here and there. And you're looking at, he's got all these friends that are like the top wow. you know, surfers in the world and has had a fascinating life, but no faith. Mm-hmm. And so we were just talking together and, uh, and I just, I've just met, but I'm getting to know him a little bit and kind of building a relationship. And, and, uh, I said to him, well, maybe, maybe for you, you know, he was talking about the fact that he's getting later in life and he's saying, you know, I don't have a wife. I don't have he's got a girlfriend, but he said, I don't have kids, don't have grandkids. My friends are trying to have grandkids and this yeah. is like yeah. the joy of their life. And he said, I, I, I miss yeah. some stuff, you know, along the way, having all my adventures, <laughs> but I miss some things that maybe, you know, maybe he's wondering if maybe those, and I said, well, I said, you know, you, you know, you've had a fascinating life, but you know, yeah, you, you wonder what, what matters the most. So he's think asking mm-hmm. those questions. So I said to him, well, I said, you know, I grew up in a, I grew up in a surfing in, at Huntington Beach and body surfing in Newport Beach. And so we connected on that, just talking about life. And, mm-hmm. and I said, and, you know, I grew up in an atheistic home where there was no faith. And I said, but you know what? I said, I, um, as a kid, I, I said, they don't, parents don't do this anymore, but my parents would just take us and drop us off at the beach yeah. and say, gave us a dime and say, you used to use a, an actual phone, like in a booth and you put a dime <laughs> in it and you'd make a phone call by dialing like this. I'm an old guy now, oh, but, wow. but, um, yeah, fingers I, callous I, from that. Oh, exactly. I'll explain yeah. to you later Cole, how it all worked. But, um, but you know, that, that, you know, I, I said to him, you know, that, you know, we would just, you know, get somebody would drop us off in the morning with our boards and our towels yeah. and stuff. And they just say, call at the end of the day. And we'd call like eight or nine o'clock at night and say, somebody come pick us up. Yeah. And we left at the beach. So they were like, junior high kids you yeah know? And, and, and so the, so i'm telling about this and we're just and you're just talking about what life was like back when we were kids and i said to him but you know what i said i said scott um i said i always had this i said the ocean the power of the ocean the waves the beauty of it all i always said there's something since there was something more there's a creator who made mm-hmm. everything and he goes yeah you know i, I kind of think about that too and we started having a spiritual conversation about uh, you know could there be a god who's made all of this i wasn't i didn't have a plan yeah. About how I was going to talk to him about, I, I actually said to him, I said, um, I said, no, Scott, you're going to, you're not going to think this is weird, but I said, I've, I spent 20 years in Michigan where they have lakes with <laughs> fresh water. And I said to him, I love salt water. As a matter of fact, I said, when I go in the water, in the ocean, I won't shower for like eight hours. I love, I said, I love the feeling of salt drying on my skin. Yeah. He goes, oh, isn't it, the, he goes, isn't it the best? He says, and I said to him, I said, as I, I said, I, this creeps my wife out and other people, I, but tell me what you think about this. I said, when the, when the salt's dried on my skin, it'd be like four or five, six hours after I've been in the ocean. I said, I'll sometimes just sort of like lick the salt off my skin. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, isn't that awesome? And I'm going, yeah. I said, well, my wife just goes, oh, that's disgusting. Yeah, well. And, and people, people listening, if, if you didn't grow up in the ocean, that might seem gross to you. But so we're just, we're just talking about life and the ocean, yeah. and, but, but it led me to talk about my belief that there's a God who created these things, right. who made beauty and creativity. And so we had this spiritual conversation. I didn't say, let me tell you about how Jesus died on the cross and you need Jesus. Yeah. But we we moved to a place of conversation that I think was very organic yeah, because it was just out of our lives. And, and that's a lot of what we try to help people understand is don't come with a program, don't come with a script, but here where a person's at. If a person's yeah. hurting, talk about how God brings comfort. Yeah. If a person's rejoicing, talk about how God is a good God who blesses us. Right. If a person loves the ocean, talk about the beauty and the power of that place. And have they ever wondered if there's a God who made all of this? Because most people will say, yeah, I've kind of wondered about that. Yeah. And that opens the door for spirit. You know, that's an organic conversation. Yeah. And it seems like you're, you're very aware of the necessity of, you know, it's, the gospel is very important. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you recognize that as a Christian, as, as a, as a pastor, but yeah. as just someone who follows Christ. And so you're, you could have easily taken that conversation elsewhere. Mm-hmm. You know, you could have easily taken that conversation, uh, in the direction of just more about surfing or body surfing mm-hmm. or, or, or even just talking about your family and, yeah. and the joys that your family brings. And he's yeah. been thinking about that. So there's clearly like a desire to bring it towards the gospel. Yeah. And, and yeah. so I guess my, the question is, you know, for like, what's that balance? Yeah. What's that balance yeah. of, of the, 
needing to feel or not to feel, but to be truly authentic and something you're passionate about. Um, but also there's a, there's a very, um, uh, seriousness to the gospel and an importance to really express, uh, the true biblical details of it. And so what's that balance? Yeah. And again, it's not a set script so that it's like, well, in every situation, do this, this, or this. But I think part of it is actually listening to people, liking Mm -hmm. people, enjoying people, not going in saying, I'm waiting for you to pause in your speech so I can jump on top of you with my next spiritual line. But um, talking with this guy, I was fascinated by his, uh, his stories and his life and what he's experienced. I was, I was wondering, you know, I wonder, I wonder, I was thinking to myself, I wonder if getting this point in your life, you wonder if you've missed out on some stuff. And then he sort of says to me, man, I think I've kind of missed out on some stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I said, yeah, I was kind of wondering what that, you know, are you like, this is all fine or do you? And, and so, so I think the balance is listening well, caring about people. I find people fascinating. I find their stories fascinating. So I'm not like acting like I'm listening till I can do the next part of my speech. Mm-hmm. I'm just having a conversation, but, but a big part of it, Cole, and I think this is an important part is that Christ is in my heart, is in my life. My greatest love is Jesus. My greatest passion is th- that his good news has changed my life and it could change other people's lives. Right. So I'm not trying to force it in there. It's kind of like if you talk to somebody who's, um, so so you grew up in San Diego. Yeah. There, there's, isn't there some kind of sporting, isn't there a base, some sporting team? I don't know. Yeah, there's I don't some know. baseball team yeah. down there. The, the Fathers. The Fathers, the yeah. Padres. Okay, yeah. so the Padres, you know. So a Padre <laughs> fan, and yeah. there's some there's some of those down in San Diego. Yeah, you grew up, a few. You know, they don't force the Padres into every conversation, but gosh, it seems like the Padres show up in a conversation if there's a reason to have it come up, right? I mean, because I mean, that that's like that's their <laughs> that's their team. That's yeah, their, that's yeah. you know, um, and and people don't go, oh, you tried to force that in a conversation. Well, yeah. oh, no, they they love the Padres. They're yeah. into it, man. And yeah. so when it when it comes up, uh, you're just gonna go, oh, that's part of that's you know that that's coal. That's you know when Nate Tibbs, yeah. who was our youth yeah. pastor, Nate, you know, just like that, it comes up. That's yeah. <laughs> that you know, and around here you got the 49ers, you've got uh, the the Warriors, you've got different you know sports teams that people get excited about and so it's not like they're sitting there consciously thinking i'm going to force this into the conversation it comes up because it's important to them mm-hmm. they're, they're excited about it. they're passionate about it i think for christians if our faith comes up because we know jesus because we love him because we know he's good mm-hmm. and he cares about the people in our life that we love and care about um jesus will come up not in a i think the balance the balance that you asked about comes because we're it's flowing out of our real life and our right. real heart. And I think this is one of the problems when somebody gets trained in evangelism and they learn that this is my script. These are the things I have to say. And it doesn't matter if I'm talking to a 80 year old, a 40 year old, a 10 year old, what their life experience is, push the button and my story comes out right. like this. No, it, or for it to be organic and balanced, it needs to be out of listening, hearing where somebody's at. When I share with the story of how I came to know Jesus, it can be shared in dozens of different ways right. because if someone's talking about a deep point of loss or maybe confusion, they don't have life direction. And I can talk about how, man, my my whole life direction changed from wanting to deal 21 in a casino and be a ski bum <laughs> uh, to feeling called to be a pastor. I mean, that's right. a big shift. Yeah, well, how did that happen? Well, if somebody's talking about you know their, their life direction and not sure where they're going, I can say, man, boy, my my life direction yeah. took a radical change when I encountered Jesus. Yeah. And I'm not um and, and, and here's the other thing too. I, I think this and again you asked about balance and you asked about how we are organic. If somebody is not interested and if somebody is is shutting you down or yeah. kind of shutting off, um, then then just then back off. Yeah. You know? And what and, and so and if somebody's, you know, all geeked up about the Padres and somebody else is just kind of like, oh, could you end it with uh, a, you know, yeah. you know, it's, it's foolish to keep pushing on when somebody yeah. else is no longer with you. Yeah. And so part of it is when you're looking at a person, you can tell if they're with you, you can Absolutely. tell if they're part of the yeah. conversation. And and I'll, I'll have conversations with people where I start to talk about something in my life that's really, I'm really passionate about. So the gospel, the good news of Jesus starts to come up and I can tell, boy, they're just not there. Yeah. I'm not going to just keep, I, I don't want to ever be accused of shoving something on someone's throat, but most people actually are fascinated. Mm-hmm. When they meet somebody who's authentic about their faith, where they're truly excited, where they actually have a relationship with Jesus that's transformational for them personally, yeah. most people are like, man, that's, tell me more. I didn't, you mean this is real to you? I mean, you're really excited about this? You don't, it's not like a hassle that you got to go to church or be yeah. a Christian. It's like, no, it's, it's exciting. People are compelled by that. Yeah. I'm, you know, I, I think the, the thing that like I've, I've thought a lot about personally, you know, with my like studies of, of you know, organic outreach and, and your books and, and just seeing how, you know, Jesus loved on people and was relational. Mm -hmm. Um, 
you know, I think for me, my, my fear is I, I, I was talking to Thomas before, uh, before we were recording and I, I really truly wholeheartedly believe that organic outreach and this concept, this model mm-hmm. is the best, um, opportunity to have an ear for, yeah. for the gospel yeah. and, and for people to be willing to receive because there's a trust there. There's a, mm-hmm. they've engaged with you. You've engaged with them. There's this, this mutual, um, respect and, and, I, I truly believe in that. And then I have, I have this fear though, that maybe like for some people that may believe that the gospel has really affected them. Um, it truly has changed their life. But yeah. I, I fear that maybe organic outreach maybe gives them an opportunity to, to say like, Oh, I'm in the process. I'm gaining trust and to really never yeah. engage in, yeah. in what it yeah. means to really share the gospel. Yeah. And so, so what, what would you kind of have to say for yeah. that group? I, I found, I felt, my, I fell myself into that group for yeah. sure. When, yeah. when I first came to shoreline, this has always yeah. been a really important thing, but I was in that group where I was yeah. like, Oh, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm doing well and I, I'm thinking about it a lot and I'm, I'm working on, I have friends that are not Christians and, but really I was not pursuing yeah. those conversations. Yeah. I was not pursuing, yeah. I hadn't, there was never the lean, even when it came up, you yeah. know? Yeah. So what would you say to those people? Yeah. I think that's not unlike people who are part of any kind of church or, you know, at any church you're part of, the pastor's going to say, you know, it's important that we share our faith and, right. and right. people will go, yeah, you're yeah, right. I, it, I sure, it sure is. Yep. Yeah. Yep. 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 And, and, you know, and, and we should probably pray for people. Yep. But then we forget to pray for them. We should probably be ready to share our story mm-hmm. of faith. And so I think that, that Cole, that's, that's not unusual. I talk with a lot of pastors who will, yeah. um, who will pull me aside and say, I'll be doing some training on evangelism and, and organic outreach. And they'll say, Hey, can I talk to you? And, and oftentimes they say, I believe in this, I preach it, but honestly, I've never really led it very well. And I really don't live it out in my mm-hmm. personal life. So I, I believe it. And I'm, I mean, my whole life is about the Bible and about God's good news, yeah. but I don't live it out in my personal life. And so I think that that's sadly more common than than not yeah but and and that's why my wife and i have spent the last 35 years uh sherry and i have really devoted ourselves to trying to create tools to help people keep it on their radar think Mm -hmm. about it not just not just say i believe in that and i agree but actually say uh you know i'm going to live this out in a a truly meaningful way and so you know one of the one of the things we do is we encourage people to you know, on a regular basis, ask themselves, am I raising the temperature of my mm-hmm. my heart and my lifestyle? So yeah. am I praying for people? Am I really praying for people that don't know Jesus? Am I preparing to share Jesus with them? Am I having spiritual conversations and ask those questions? Mm-hmm. And uh, the book that Sherry and I are writing right now, Organic Disciples, is all about how every part of our spiritual growth should actually lead us out with the good news in the world. So if we're growing in the Bible, the Bible shares the heart of God for the world and it should lead us out. Mm-hmm. Then we follow Jesus. He leads us into the world because that's where Jesus is always going. He's always going to the broken. He's always going to the right. lost. He's always looking for that one lost sheep. And if we're walking close to Jesus, guess what? We're going there with him. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that I, I would say to people, don't be discouraged if you look and say, I believe in this, but I really haven't done much about it. But I would say, keep asking yourself, what's my next step? That was kind of the theme of the message uh, that, that I preached yeah. yesterday about this. And, you know, talking about I will proclaim is what's my next step? Mm-hmm. What's my next thing I can do? Can I begin praying more for my neighbors? Can I begin serving them in some way? But always looking and saying, but I also want to have an opportunity to share that good news, that story yeah. of Jesus and the difference he's made. And so don't be discouraged, but keep pressing forward. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Cause I know in your message, uh, yesterday you, you asked, um, you know, what if our hearts, uh, what if our hearts are not big enough uh, for, or excuse me, what, what you, you were said, uh, uh, if our hearts are big enough for the whole world. Yeah. And, uh, I guess the question is if, you know, I feel like if people really look yeah. internally, yeah. uh, you know, what if that answer is no. And like, what if, yeah. you know, I, I understand my faith. Um, and I understand the, the need that the world has for Jesus, but, yeah. uh, you know, my heart doesn't break for that. And yeah. like, I don't, yeah. I don't pursue that. What, you know, yeah. what if my answer is no? Yeah. You know the found the founder of world mission uh, the founder of world vision had a saying and I got to go to the uh, the corporate head world mm-hmm. headquarters of world vision and on the wall it had the saying it said, it said let your heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God hmm. and so he said well what if my heart doesn't break the way God's heart yeah. breaks what if my heart isn't as big as God's heart is for the whole world well here's the reality 
my heart doesn't break like the heart of God, yeah. and my heart is not as big as God's heart, and my heart's not big enough to love the whole world. But but by asking that question in the sermon, what I was really saying is, will you look and say, God, can you grow my heart? Can you actually make my heart mm-hmm. bigger for the world than it is? And if somebody, if somebody says, well, I'm a Christian, I love Jesus, but I don't care about anybody else but myself, then I'm, I'm going to wonder, do you really, what Jesus are you talking about? Because right. that, that Jesus, his heart did break for the world. He, yeah. he loved the broken, the outcast, the hurting. He was drawn towards them, and they loved him too. Yeah. And so... I think, I think, you know, so when I asked that question in the sermon, you know, is, is your heart big enough, as big as God's heart, is your heart big enough for the whole world? Yeah. Um, if I'm going to be, if I'm going to be analytical and honest, I'm going to say, no, it's not. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I, my heart's not big enough just for my own family sometimes, right? Yeah. Or just what I have to deal with this week. But the point is, will I keep saying, God, your heart is big enough for the whole world. I want my heart to become like yours. Mm-hmm. And so, God, keep growing my heart. And I would say to the pe- people listening, if you could pray and say, God, make my heart more like yours, make my heart bigger. When I run out of you know, care or concern for others, God, will you step in mm-hmm. and take that, take that part within me and grow that part of my heart that's not big enough? Yeah. And, and I think if we have God's heart, and I, and I get moments where I get glimpses of that, where I feel like, man, my heart's becoming more like the heart of Jesus. It's wonderful. And then there's other yeah. times where it's like, I can be very self-centered and very self-focused yeah. and um, just being honest. There's times where it's like, man, I can just, there's times where I'll, you know, you, you know, I travel a fair amount for, for ministry things and for personal things. And there's times I get on a plane and I might say, Lord, you know, let someone sit next to me who, yeah. who's far from you that I can have a conversation. Sometimes I'm like, God, I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I just pray that people will leave me alone. Yeah. And you go, well, a pastor shouldn't say that. I'm just telling you, there's 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 days like that. Yeah. And uh, Mama said there'd be days like this. <laughs> and, and it's like on those days, I just kind of go, okay, Lord, change my heart. Or if my heart doesn't change, let me take a little nap, yeah. wake up a little more refreshed, and maybe my heart will feel better later. You know. And and God is like a God dangerous is, prayer. <laughs> God is yeah, but God is gracious too. He yeah. understands us. Yeah. He knows us. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how, how is, uh, you know, Jesus, that model of faith, how, how, how is, can you give us some examples of, mm-hmm. of where Jesus is saying, you know, through his actions and through his, through his words as well, but that his heart is broken for, yeah. for the lost. Is there, yeah. do you have any examples of the. Yeah. The, I, I tell you, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the yeah. four gospels, it just comes with that again and again and again. If you want one of the gospels that probably that has narrative stories uh, Luke has lots of parables and teaching. Mm-hmm. John has narrative stories. Cool. And so the gospel of John, you know, you could read, if you look at John chapter three and chapter four, back to back chapters, yeah. you, you get a great picture of organic outreach of Jesus reaching out with his love. In John chapter three, it's to the guy named Nicodemus. Mm-hmm. Nicodemus is part of the Sanhedrin, which was the ancient Jewish high court. So kind of the Supreme court of the Jewish nation. Yeah. So he's a big deal. Um, he's very wealthy. He's highly educated. Mm-hmm. He's very powerful. Uh, and interestingly, he comes to Jesus at nighttime. And, and, and the Greek language, and it says he came at night. You could almost translate it under the cloak of night. He didn't want to be noticed. You know, oh, he yeah. kind of came kind of yeah. hiding out and coming to Jesus. And they have, and that's where Jesus says, you must be born again. And he's a rabbi. So he says, what I'm supposed to like, wait, let me see if I got this right. I climb back inside my mother and she pushes <laughs> me out again. And she says, no, that's not the point. No. They, they have this whole rabbinical back and forth kind yeah. of fa- you know, <clears throat> fascinating almost debate, discussion, argument. I had a chance to be at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem and watch these rabbis. It looked like they were just screaming at each other and yelling, but they were like debating the scriptures and go back and forth oh, and wow. really fiery. <laughs> and, and I can see Jesus and Nicodemus like Nicodemus yeah. going, well, you're saying this. And Jesus is like, no, I'm not saying that. When I'm, but you know, there's this vibrant conversation, but this amazing conversation that opened up Nicodemus's heart to who Jesus was. Yeah, Jesus talked with Nicodemus like he was a Jewish rabbi, right? Because Nicodemus was a, a Jewish, Jewish rabbi, rabbi right? Yeah, yeah. And so it's now you go, you, you turn the page of your Bible, and some Bibles are on the, like the next page, right yeah. there, open face to face, and you go to John chapter four, and Jesus is now in Samaria, yeah. And this is a group of people that are very uh, estranged. They have some historical bloodline and connection with the Jewish people, but there's a lot of uh, bad blood and division mm-hmm. between them. And now it's not a man, Nicodemus, it's a woman, the woman at the well. Right, it's right. not someone rich and powerful, it's a woman who's very poor. It's not somebody who would see themselves as super spiritual, but she's been through one marriage, another marriage, another marriage, another marriage, a series of marriages. Now she's living with a guy she's not married to. Mm-hmm. She's living in sin. She doesn't come in the middle of the night. She comes in the bright, hottest point of the day. She actually comes to this well where Jesus is sitting, waiting, and the disciples have gone into the town to get some food. Jesus is sitting by the well. And she comes then because the women all came early in the morning when it was cool, late in the evening when it was cool out. 
They didn't come in the middle of the day. She came mm -hmm. so she could avoid everybody. She wasn't popular. She wasn't part of the inside group. And Jesus talks with her as a Samaritan woman who is spiritually hungry and curious. And they have this incredible spiritual conversation. Yeah. Totally different than the conversation with Nicodemus. Because she's a different person. Mm -hmm. She has a different journey. Yeah. And so when you, when you read John chapter 3 and John chapter 4, you get this picture of Jesus doing organic outreach, yeah. sharing who he is in a way that fits that person. Jesus didn't have this prepared script that he just kind of blah, poured yeah. out to every person. He, he Nicodemus had his own story, his own background, his own intellect, intellect and the way he came at the world. This woman at the well was actually very theologically astute. And she, mm -hmm. at one point she says, you know, well, our teachers say that you're supposed to worship here on Mount Gerizim, but now your people say you're supposed to worship on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And Jesus says, you know, basically this is when he says, well, the time is coming and now has come where true worshipers will not worship. In, it's not about where they worship the place, but true worshipers, worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. Mm -hmm. So they had this incredible theological conversation. She was very bright and she was articulate. They had a great conversation, but it was very different than the conversation with Nicodemus. Yeah. Um, when you read John 3 and 4, and I believe that th those stories are back to back for a very specific reason so that we can look and realize, wow, Jesus talk with each person out of who they were, where they were, where they were, what their needs were, their own story, their own background, their history, and the conversation fit that person. You can almost say that conversation was organic. It was almost. natural, right? Almost. almost. We won't, but you can <laughs> but you, but you can almost say that. But but you go, "Oh, why would they be such different conversations because these are different people?" Yeah. And so what we try to help people understand is when you love Jesus, when you walk with him, when you know the story of of Jesus Christ coming, God with us, his death on the cross, his resurrection, the price he paid, the grace he offers, you can have that you can have that conversation in a thousand different ways. Right. The same good news of the gospel shared in a thousand different ways. Why? Because it's a thousand different people. Yeah. And each person is their own person. And so that, and so Jesus models that. And if you just walk through each conversation he had was different because each person is different. Yeah. And I love how that, that like it creates the, the realities of, of outreach through your testimony. Yeah. And, and it, and so like, you know, all those people, Nicodemus, the woman at the well, they, they have their own testimony. Even yeah. the, the woman at the well, and she runs back to the, the city and is just like, come and see this man. You know, yeah. it, I, I love how, you know, there's uniqueness to that, but is there, yeah. you know, is, is that the way, is that the way we need to do it is only with our testimonies? I, I don't think so. I think there's a beauty to that, but how, how do you, um, you know, is that the testimony? It, does it come up in conversation because, you know, you're that connected to that person. Mm -hmm. You're that, you know, cause Jesus, the Jewish rabbi and yeah. the Nicodemus, yeah. or, or is it like, I don't know. I feel like you can use your testimony in more than just yeah. like your internal circles or the yeah. people that are like-minded or, yeah. um, but I, I love that the examples of, of how testimonies come into play. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think that every, you know, the thing that's so beautiful about a person's testimony or you can, you know, testimony is a, a kind of a biblical word yeah. or, or, yeah. or, a, or a, a churchy kind of word. But if you just said your, your, your story, story your, yeah. your own story, um, we're sitting here in the studio here, and I think I think of Tom. I know I know a lot of Thomas's story. I know mm -hmm. that the, that he grew up in a home where his grandpa was his was his pastor when he was a kid, and <laughs> and, and it had its own unique challenges along the, the journey. But but also, um, you know, if Thomas shares his story, it's his story, and mm -hmm. nobody's gonna ever say to Thomas, "No, that's not what happened." Yeah. It's like, well, no, that's that was that was his life. That was that my was experience. His journey. Yeah. yeah. Um, and if somebody was to say to Thomas, you know, so what do you do for your work? And he says, "I'm a videographer." Oh, what kind of video do you do? Well. You know, I do podcasts and things for church services and I test, you know, testimonies or stories. And, and as he's telling his life story, somebody say, oh, you mean what? And Tommy, maybe you've had this, Thomas, but you know, somebody says, what? I mean, a, a church, a church actually has like a video guy. What would a church, have you, have you ever had that conversation? Oh, all, all the time. Yeah. 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 What it's, do you uh, do all day? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's a real conversation starter. Is it really? Yeah. Oh, I, I, I know you're, I, it's funny. I, yeah. I, I was trying to think like, did I, have I talked to Kevin about this? Cause that <laughs> yeah. literally that's like, whenever that question comes up, it's like, all right, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. We're yeah. going to have a spiritual conversation yeah. one way or another. You know, so what, what is it you do? And within that, you know, you, you're, and, and you're capturing the story of Jesus. You're capturing mm -hmm. people's stories of how they've been touched and changed by Jesus. Right. right. And, and Cole, you know, people, you know, and it's more common that people, people think, well, a church, they got like, most churches have a organist or a piano player, or a <laughs> choir leader or a worship leader. Yeah, like yeah. you are, you don't play yeah. the organ. I don't. Uh, but, um, but, but, you know, if somebody says, that's more common. Oh, oh, you're the the music leader at the church. Yeah. Um, 
but even that it becomes an opportunity to talk about your upbringing, your life, your faith, yeah. um, what you believe about worship. Why mm-hmm. you know you you your job is to help people encounter God through singing yeah. songs and through worshiping and through praying and and so you know, for each of us because of the work we do, our life experience, our journey, um, that tells a story to people and yeah. helps them understand how God interacts with our lives. And I think that uh, I tell people, you don't just have one testimony, you have thousands of testimonies. Because yeah. every time God does something in your heart, in your life, every time God comforts you or empowers you or strengthens you or gives you wisdom or provides in an amazing way, that's another story you can share Absolutely. about what God is doing and about how God works. And so um, I think there's something very powerful about people's stories. And, and you you had mentioned, Cole, in John chapter 4, this woman that Jesus encounters at the well, she, through the whole conversation in John chapter 4, she mm-hmm. comes to recognize that this is the Messiah, this is right. the Savior. And so she puts down her water jar, she goes into the town, she says, come and meet a man, come and see a man that told me everything I ever did. And this woman, everyone in town knew that everything she ever did was not lots of good stuff. Right. But she said, he knows everything about me. And you can almost hear it, she said, he knows everything about me, everything I ever did. But he loves me. But mm-hmm. he 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 you know, could this be the Messiah? Is this the Messiah? And then people came out. They put their faith in Jesus because of her testimony. But then they also came out to see Jesus. And some of them put their faith in Jesus because of her testimony. But then when they saw him, they put their faith in Jesus because of right. who he was. And so I encourage every Christian to actually learn to tell their stories of what God's doing in their life. Right. And I I find that people. I've got a number of friends here in the Monterey area who aren't yet followers of Jesus, but they're fascinated Mm -hmm. that um, when they meet somebody who really believes what they believe and who's not like kooky and crazy, but just a pretty, pretty normal person, (laughs) but excited about their faith and who, who knows that there's comfort in hard times, there's strength in times of weakness and that we find that in Jesus. When people recognize that, they they can be kind of like, well, that's, there's something real about this. And I kind of, I thought faith and religion were sort of just a game that people played, but this is a normal person who this is like a real part of their life. Uh, And they seem sensible. They don't seem to have lost their minds. And yet they, they really believe this. And that causes people to say, well, maybe there's something to this. Yeah. And that's, and our testimony has power. And then if we just share a testimony of how we came to faith in Jesus and how we came to who he was and put our trust in him, that's also a specific kind of testimony about how I became a Christian. But we have lots of testimonies. Yeah, I know. I, I've definitely experienced, I think, I think I've, I have a lot of family and friends that, you know, I've, I've had the joke, you know, thrown towards me of, of like, oh, it's easy for you to bring up spiritual conversations because people go, what do you do for work? And you Mm -hmm. go, oh, I'm the music director at Shoreline Church. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, but it's, it's interesting how that actually has backfired for me Mm -hmm. a lot. Like, uh, I had a neighbor who asked me that question and this is like the second time I'd ever like interacted with him. And it was, it was like, oh, what do you do for work? And it was, I said, oh, I'm the music director for Shoreline Church. And, and that, statement just shut him off. Mm. He ended the conversation very awkwardly, very abruptly, very yeah. uncomfortably and like ended it and walked away. Mm. And then later came back to me and was like, I don't want to hear about your faith. I don't want to hear about your job. I don't want to hear about, you know, and it was very, very, very. And I found out later that there's a huge, there was a huge stigma towards Christians, towards the church, towards, towards people who, um, you know, are vocationally in ministry and a long story, but throughout time, throughout, uh, other conversations throughout, you know, hearing about my family, hearing about my wife and yeah. getting to know her, there was a much more, uh, openness yeah. to, to yeah. who I am as a, as a person. And this realization of like, I thought I had you pegged. Like yeah. I thought I had, you're this, one of them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then getting to know me as a, I would say semi-normal person, yeah. uh, uh, that's generous. Yeah, that's that is yeah. generous. I tend to be that way with myself, yeah. but, uh, uh, yeah, just how man, a, the different testimony, a yeah. different story, a different experience in my life cr- created this opportunity where he was more open to hearing about my faith yeah. than when I said, Oh, I'm the music director at shoreline yeah. church yeah. and he was shut off, you know? So yeah. it's, it's interesting how everyone does have, like you said, thousands of testimonies yeah. and, you know, sometimes some connect with certain people and that's the Mm -hmm. uniqueness of organic outreach, right? I mean, that's the uniqueness of people experiencing you, uh, when it's, when it's natural and it's normal. And, and I mean, he asked me what I did for work, so it wasn't like I was being unnatural, but it's interesting how you, you see how it plays out. And that's a dramatic experience. I I understand, but, um, 
hey, something that kind of ties into that as well, because a lot of that had to do my positive relationship with this this uh, former neighbor of mine had a lot to do with uh, my deeds and how I interacted yeah. with him. And and uh, in Romans fifteen, um, the Apostle Paul, you know, talks about uh, how him proclaiming the gospel. Uh, is being in his words and in his deeds. So, yeah. uh, how do how do words and deeds? How do how do your actions and yeah. your in your words? Yeah. Uh, how do those work together? How do those coincide? Yeah, and that's something too that transcends faith and Christianity. Yeah. Is that you know we we all understand if somebody if somebody says um, you know if 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 a husband says oh I love my wife she means the world to me and he never spends any time with her and he always mm-hmm. speaks poorly of her and he. Um, he's rude and insensitive, and but he says, but, but I'm crazy about her. She's the most important person in my life, and he spends all his free time with his buddies mm-hmm. and is never with her. There's a point at which people are going to say, okay, you keep saying <laughs> what she means to you, but every outside yeah. indicator is you're just not that terribly interested in that woman, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, pe- people see through that. People read that. And that's yeah. been, I think that's been one of the challenges uh, in Christianity through through. Uh, through time is that when you have people who say they believe something mm-hmm. with such deep conviction and then their actions don't seem to bear it out. Right. And so when a person when a person says they're a follower of Jesus and they don't act or live in a way that reflects the heart of Jesus, uh, I think it's not only appropriate for people to question them, I think it's it's what you'd expect. Right. Um and I and I you know I I, I'm very careful as a pastor to be very clear that I don't have my everything mastered. I have my own challenges, my own struggles. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't hold myself up as if I hold myself up as an example in a sermon, it's as likely going to be an example of, of struggle as as I, I'm very rarely saying there's a perfect way to behave. Let me tell you a story about from my life about right. how I do this perfectly. Um, I'm just I, I I know myself too well, <laughs> and so I I yeah. you know and so. I'm becoming more like Jesus with time. I'm growing in Christ likeness as every Christian should. But the more consistent my life is with what I say I believe, mm-hmm. I think the more seriously someone's going to take who right. I am and what I believe. And that's why I think that, and it does say the Apostle Paul talks about how his witness and his testimony and his ministry came through all that he said and all that he did. Right. And and when there's a when there's a uh, alignment there, where there's a consistency there, I think people are much quicker to listen to what we have to say. Mm-hmm. And so I just, you know, I I try to in my own life examine my heart and examine my lifestyle, and if I'm going to live out my faith. And and again, some people are going to that they're going to see Jesus in our actions as much as hear Jesus in our mm-hmm. words. Now, I also want to say some Christians like to say, okay, so here's my deal. Is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to do lots of nice stuff to, you know, kind of act like Jesus, I but I'm gospel. never going to say yeah. a word. Yeah. And I think we talked about that a, a while back in the yeah. series. Um, nobody's good enough that their that their actions are. I mean, <laughs> G- here, here's the, here's the point. Jesus was Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> and he talked about who he was. Yeah. Jesus didn't say, oh, oh, I'm not going to. He didn't say to Nicodemus, hey, just look at me. Yeah. You're going to figure it out. Yeah. He says, unless you unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. Right. I mean, Jesus spoke words with his actions. Yeah. And so I think that's the same thing for us. We have to align those things. Yeah. What happens when somebody says, hey, why are you, why do you act so positively? And why do you act with so much love? Mm-hmm. But you don't say anything. You don't, <laughs> how do you respond to that? You say, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I just I don't do. Know. It's just who I I'm am. I'm just a good guy. Yeah, I'm just know? a good guy. And that's when you get to, that's when you get to point to Jesus and let yeah. people know that he's the one who's been transforming yeah. your life and will continue to. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, it's definitely, uh, you need the two together. Mm-hmm. They definitely work together. It's like truth and love, you know, uh, it's, it's powerful. Um, hey, I wanted to ask you too about, uh, you know, organic outreach and, and, uh, <coughs> something that you talked about in, in your sermon this past Sunday is the, uh, the 1040 window. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. uh, can you explain a little bit about the 1040 window? And my, my question is knowing, uh, about the 1040 window, how does organic outreach play into that yeah. when it's ends of the earth, you know, Judea, yeah. Samaria, ends yeah. of the earth. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, if you take the equator and you go 10 degrees north of the equator to 40 degrees north of the equator, that strip of the of the particularly of um, the Africa and Asia continent mm-hmm. across there uh, into Indonesia, um, that part of the world. Uh, somebody years ago kind of looked at that from from that that ten that window from ten degrees to forty degrees north of the equator um, is one of the most uh, impoverished areas, mm-hmm. one of the most um, 
just challenging for people to live and survive there. Right. It's a very challenging area to live and survive. And also uh, one of the least churched areas in the world. Mm -hmm. And there's countries there that, you know, they, they, they do study, study this and say, you know, that maybe 10% of the population is, is Christian or, or less than half a percent are Christian, or in some cases, like less than 1% of people have even heard the message of Jesus' love right. and Jesus' grace. So that 1040 window is an area that has tremendous needs in many levels. And so, you know, when Jesus, when Jesus was, getting ready to, he died on the cross, he'd risen again, he was going to ascend back to heaven, and he's talking to his disciples in, in Matthew chapter 28, and he says, um, he, he says, you know, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything I've commanded you. Mm -hmm. He says, I am with you even to the ends of the age. And so he says, you go from Jerusalem, right where you live, to Judea, your surrounding community, to Samaria, which was actually the places that people avoided. Right. Matter of fact, in that John chapter four passage we were talking about where Jesus ends up in Samaria, it says they were, most people, the Jewish people would go around Samaria just to avoid it because there was so much conflict, but they went through Samaria. So that, that's the kind of the area that people avoid. And then the ends of the earth is the ends of the earth, the yeah. furthest places away, the places that are most unreached. And so, you know, organic outreach, we, we train and equip leaders all around the world. Right. For Shoreline Church, we're we're actually establishing a vision for 2021, 22 and 23, a three-year plan we're designing right now to to find a place in the 1040 window where there's deep need right. for the gospel, for physical care and help, for mercy and compassion. Uh, and and we're going to partner with a ministry in that area where we can bring solar-powered audio Bibles. Yeah where we can look, probably do a water project or something that will help with physical, tangible needs that way. Very cool. Uh, yeah. Where we can send teams to equip and train pastors and leaders mm -hmm. to do effective outreach in that part of the world, where we can pray as a congregation, where we can support what's happening there, and, and hopefully about every quarter and every six months have a, a report on hopefully new churches started, yeah. people coming to faith in Jesus. And so when the Apostle Paul says in, in Romans 15, I want to go to places basically where Christ has not been heard of yet. I want to go to yeah. places that haven't been reached yet. He also, so he talks about go right where you live. And we talked about, you know, look out the window right where you are. Uh, who are people right around me? But also go to places where Christ is not, his mm -hmm. name hasn't been known. So as a church, we're going to continue to challenge everyone to reach out in their neighborhood. But we're also going to say as a congregation, we can unify our prayers, our resources, our passion, uh, and partner with a place in the world where many, many, many people have not heard about Jesus and make yeah. him available. And again, do it organically, not force Jesus on anybody, but make him available to all. Yeah. It did, I, I was just, as you were talking, I was thinking about, is it, you know, cause I, I know we see, um, you know, the biblical truths of like the way that Jesus was relational and, and mm -hmm. compassionate and kind and loving. Now, I think that those are, uh, intrinsic, you know, values throughout the world. Um, but when we're training people uh, in organic outreach mm -hmm. around the world, and I know we've done a lot in like India and things like that, uh, is it a different, like, is there a cultural aspect to it? Is there like a, I mean, maybe there's not, I don't, I, yeah. I'm, I, I was just thinking about that. Is there a different, cause I know like, wasn't, isn't it illegal to, to proselytize or yeah. to, you know, do like mm -hmm. the public square thing in, yeah. in India now. So is there a different like cultural aspect to that, to the training of organic outreach, like in other yeah. parts of the country or world, excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. It, it varies from place to place. And so the last, we did, we did a series of, I think six or seven training events in mm -hmm. India and Sri Lanka. And we had our team, team members there doing their training, the equipping and, and the very first training event, it was interesting. Um, our trainers started teaching and there was, there was a good group of pastors there, but about an hour into the training, the pastors started making phone calls during the training. It looked mm -hmm. like they were distracted by getting on their phones. Yeah. And then um, one of the trainers, one of our trainers said, is something wrong or is everything okay? And the pastors actually said, well, you know, we came to this training because this pastor in this church invited us and added to honor him and respect him, we came, but we didn't think this was going to be helpful. We didn't think yeah. Americans would really be able to bring much to help <laughs> us. And also we've been told that proselytizing is illegal in India. Yeah. What they meant by that was open air street preaching. They thought the only way to share Jesus was open air street yeah. preaching. Yeah. So that when they were told they couldn't do that, yeah, we can't do evangelism anymore. We can't do outreach. They said, but when you're explaining what you mean by organic outreach, that all of us can love our neighbors, care for them, learn to share our faith, share our testimony. And they learn, they realize that, well, we can't proselytize on the street. We yeah. can't do open air preaching. But what you're teaching us is that every one of us can pray for people, can love them, can have conversations yeah. to share how God's changed our lives, share our story and the story of Jesus. 
And so we're actually right now, we're texting and contacting other pastors saying, come to this training, this will help yeah. you, this is what we need. And people started coming and flooding in. Some of them hadn't paid to come. And then the host pastor said, oh, you can't come unless you paid. And our team actually said, yeah. no, we'll cover the cost. Yeah. If you're, if, and a lot of these are very poor pastors. Yeah. They said, just anyone who wants to come, come, we'll figure out the money later. But right now you get in here and get trained. And so what they realize is, is that the way we come at things through Organic Irish, because it's not a program, but it's a philosophy of ministry yeah. that's very natural and contextualized. Everybody has to kind of do it to their own setting. We find that the training, we, you know, we do training in you know, India and Sri Lanka, like we mentioned. I did a about an eight-hour open air training under a palapa in, in El Salvador <laughs> and people walk, some people walked like eight or nine hours to get there to get trained. That's crazy. And that's uh, nice. I had three translators. They would take turns. I, I talk, <laughs> I can talk kind of quickly. And when I get excited, I talk really yeah, quickly. Yeah. And so my translators would go about 15 to 20 minutes each. And they would like, they would like tag team, switch <laughs> out like wrestling, you know, like tag team wrestling at least. Yeah. And then the next one come in, translate, then they tag the next one. Yeah. And, and then it came to the time for the lunch break. And all the people were like, no, no, don't take a break. Just keep teaching. They were so hungry to learn. And yeah. we still, we took a little lunch break, but got back at it. And I taught just, you know, and they were, they, they said this this we can take this we'll need to tweak it here or there for our setting but we can make this mm -hmm. work um done training in australia new zealand uh Gua a team that did training in guatemala um in uh is it kenya i think we did training about a year i think it was in kenya yeah. so what we're finding is that early on when we were developing organic outreach the uh when there were concepts that didn't seem universal and that weren't applicable to anybody anywhere, mm -hmm. we just kind of stripped them out and said, then, then these must not be the core things. Yeah. And I think we distilled it down to the essential things. And if they're the most essential things, I think to a large degree, they will be transferable if a person can contextualize them yeah. in their own setting. Yeah. Because any, I mean, honestly, in Monterey, you know, if I'm talking with a person in one location or another location, they may have a whole different story. Right. And you always have to contextualize. But the yeah. basic principles of sharing your story, sharing God's story, praying for people in a time of need, not being obnoxious and overbearing, listening to people. You go, oh, those are transferable. That's just yeah. how we should live. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I guess my, my, my final question really is, I, I feel like this is important. I feel like this is, I think this is very uh, educational too for people to know like, oh, there's, there's opportunities, there's, there's natural ways for me to, to, to reach out. Are there any, um, you know, resources right off the bat? Um, obviously your three, uh, Organic Outreach uh, for New People, Churches and Families. Yeah. Um, those three books. I know there's, you know, the Organic Disciples is yep. to come. Uh, yep. But are there any other resources that you can think of off the top of your head that we can be like mm. investing in and thinking about? Yeah. I know we have stuff on our website too, yeah. but. Yeah. So I would say two things right off the top of my head. One is I would encourage every single person to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, mm -hmm. and just look at Jesus and how he loved people, how he shared, how he reached out, how he he showed compassion, but he also used words. And the best thing we can do is if we call ourselves disciples, which means followers, uh, to follow the example of Jesus. Yeah. So start there. Number two, um, we have a wonderful website with Organic Outreach, organicoutreach.org. Yeah. Everything on it is basically free. There's there's a store where you can buy resources for churches, but for right. individuals, there's all kinds of resources that are available for free. And uh, and then here at Shoreline, we're we've got a, a class coming up. And anyone anywhere in the world who's watching this, if you want to jump in, it's going to be two yeah. consecutive Wednesdays, led by our two organic outreach international leaders, uh, by by Walt Bennett and by Tom Green. And I would just challenge people to go on the Shoreline website and yeah. pick up the Wednesday night classes and register for the one called Joy to the World. It's free, costs you nothing, yeah. and you'll get some great equipping and training and how to naturally, organically share your yeah. faith. Yeah, very cool. I, I'm hoping that this time, you know, we, we you know definitely dove a little deeper into what you were talking about on Sunday. But I'm hoping that this time can really encourage people mm -hmm. and remind them that, like, as a as a Christian, as a believer, there's yeah. this really profound uh reality for your life that yeah. it's been it's been paid for your yeah. sins have been paid yeah. for and we need to share that and mm -hmm. so uh i i just love this this concept i i i love the way that it's changed my life it's mm -hmm. changed my wife's life mm -hmm. um and yeah, it's just a, it's a powerful reality. So hoping this is like, you know, leaving people wanting more, wanting yeah. to seek out more. So, yeah. uh, thank you, Kevin, for, uh, sitting down and talking about this. I know that you're a passionate person about yeah. this, yeah. obviously. Uh, and so I really appreciate the time, the energy that you've, uh, put into organic outreach, but even just now, uh, investing mm -hmm. in this, I, I'm really grateful that we can mm -hmm. have an opportunity for people to really, uh, you know, 
get it from the source of these yeah. these books, but also just someone who's really passionate about it and see how it's affected your life. Yeah. And and so thank you for doing that. It's, it's been good to have you back on uh, the, our little podcast here. We're, um, I love these. These are so fun. Yeah. It's, I, been, it's been a joy and I'm looking forward to next week. Yeah, yeah. Next week we're going to talk about, uh, you know, this has all been I will, I will. Yeah. First, I believe and I will. Next week we're going to talk about I will beware. Yeah. And Paul gives six different things to be aware of in the last chapter of Romans. And that's going to be a fun conversation yeah. to do. So I look forward to talking some more oh, next yeah. week. I know. It's going to be a fun, convicting uh, podcast. So Absolutely. thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for being here. My joy. Whether you're watching this podcast on the YouTube channel or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe to hear our weekly episodes. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you next week with another one.